Our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. Then I looked, and there was a great multitude which no one could count, from all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these clothed in white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are those who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall never, neither hunger any more, nor shall they thirst any more. The sun shall never strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. So our scripture today was written by the Apostle John, and now I know that for the entire rest of the service, everything I say will not be heard because you will be singing, who's that writing? John the Revelator, right? So according to Biblegate, uh, doc, BibleGateway.com, Revelations was written to seven churches in Asia Minor to warn them against falling away from their faith in Christ. And it's also offered assurance of an ultimate victory to those who remain on God's side. Revelation is what's called apocalyptic literature. And when we think of the word apocalypse, we almost always associate that word with something like the end of the world, right? Huge events that cause some sort of massive change in how people live their lives. That is how we tend to view apocalypse as a word. However, the Greek word apocalypse means uncovering, unveiling, or revelation. So it is important for us to know that in the, in the Greek term, and then also in Jewish apocalyptic writing, uh, we see the use of figurative language and symbolism to show that evil will be replaced by the goodness and peace of God's kingdom. Now we can see that use of figurative language and how John describes the lamb in our scripture today. The lamb is referring to Jesus, and the people of the multitude of nations singing together and sitting before the throne of God and the Lamb had first gone through the tribulations and then were made white by washing in the blood of that Lamb. Now, as I've said before in some past uh, sermons, I am not a great interpreter of figurative language, but I think there's some things today that we can look at and even I can understand. I find that this passage of scripture is especially one that we can focus on for our remembrance of All Saints Day. This is the day that we stop as a church and remember all the people and their lives that came before us and have gone on to glory in heaven. This piece of scripture is one that is used to comfort people in a time of loss, and you're most likely to hear it read at a funeral service. When we think about the saints that have gone on before us, we are often overcome with a feeling of sadness. And that's our normal human response to the loss of someone we love. One of the hardest things about being a pastor is trying to prepare a funeral service. Trying to find the words of comfort for people during their grieving time is something that is very, very difficult. You can think that you have the greatest words for them, you give it to them, and they may even react in an angry manner back towards you. Not, to, not because of what you've said to them, but because of how much they're hurting. And planning those services is especially true when a person that has passed away was young or their death was very sudden. We as people often ask the question and try to understand things this way. 
Why did this happen? Why did it have to happen to them? Why would God allow such a thing to happen? The truth is that we can ask ourselves that question until we are driven crazy. We will most likely never know why in these situations. It is a hard thing, but a true thing, that the Lord works in ways that we simply cannot understand. There is a purpose for all things. And I know that when we lose someone that we love, those words are not the most comforting thing to hear. However, when we look at our description of what awaits those that we lose, I think we can take comfort in those ideas. The idea that the person that we have lost is standing before God and the Lamb in their spotless robe. The idea that they have been made whole again in heaven. And I think we can take great comfort when we remember starting at verse 16, they shall neither hunger anymore, nor shall they thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor the scorching heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them, and he will lead them to springs of life of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. See, for them there is no more pain. There is no more suffering. There is no more dealing with the trials and tribulations of our mortal world. They are now with their Heavenly Father, and He is attending to them as they are attending to Him. There are no more tears because He wipes them away from their eyes. The only thing that is left for them is to be is joy at being a part of that heavenly body. And when I think about the people that have gone before me in this life, I try to focus on the things that I learned from them. I like to think about how I can live my life in a way that honors them. One of the great traditions that people in Latin America celebrate is the Dios de los Muertos, and please excuse my Spanish, or translated to the Day of the Dead. See, there are many different things that they do to celebrate, including special treats, they have parades, and they have elaborate costumes with full makeup that they come up with, and it's really an amazing celebration. Other parts of this tradition include going to the graves of those that have passed, and they set up, they set up special tables or on the mantles in their house, and they put pictures of those people that have passed away. Then they gather as a family, and they tell stories about those people. In this way, they believe that the people that they have lost are not really gone because their memory continues on. And I think it's a wonderful tradition and something that I encourage all of us to do, especially on this day. See, I know that it can be hard for us to talk about the people that we've lost in our lives, but what a wonderful way to allow their legacy to continue on on this earth. For me, when I think about the people that I've lost, I like to imagine them as that part of those band of angels. They're standing there before God, and I like to remember all the important things that they have taught me. I think about the good times that I shared with them. I also like to think about what would they think about the life that I am living. When I was a younger person, the WWJD bracelets were a pretty popular thing to have. And in case you don't remember, that stands for what would Jesus do? And while I believe that that is the measuring stick for how we should live our lives, what would Jesus do in this situation? That is the ultimate measuring stick. I also like to think about what would my grandma Minnie do? What would my pappy Ray do? What would my uncle Fred do? What would my pappy Jim and my grandma Pink do? You see, each of these people were instrumental in my life, and they were people that shaped it in such wonderful ways. So for me, the best way that I can honor them is to try and live my life in a way that would make them proud. And I don't do this or think about this to shame myself when I fall short, and I don't do this to make myself sad because I've lost them. I do this so that I can remember them in a positive and heartfelt way. See, while I am sad that they are no longer here with me on earth, I know that one day I'm going to be with them again. One day I'm going to join them in that heavenly choir and we're going to sing praises to the Lord. One day I'm going to stand with them and attend to God and to the Lamb. 
And one day there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more tears. There will only be joy. If you haven't made that decision for yourself today, and if you don't know what awaits you at the end of this life, well, I urge you to give your heart to Jesus fully this day. My challenge is for you this week, think about someone that you've lost. Remember the good memories you have of them. Share those memories with somebody else. Tell their stories. Think about how you can live your life in a way that would honor their memory. Amen.